Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining our final tutorial of the week and this will be on difficult topics by Dr. Daniel Hodder. So just some house rules for everyone watching. If you're in the Zoom call, you can uh, interact with questions, comments, feel free to throw them in. You, we only ask that if you have questions or comments that refer to what's on the screen now, you use the chat box. If you have any questions or comments that can wait till the end, use the Q&A box and Dr. Hodder will get to them. If you're watching on our YouTube page, again, feel free to comment and question but Dr. Hodder will only be able to get to those towards the end of the session. Otherwise, yeah, have fun. And for everyone in the Zoom chat, whenever a question gets asked, the polls will pop up on your screen so you don't need a link to another website to do anything like that. And off to you, Dr. Hodder. Great, okay. Welcome everyone. And thank you, Essan, for that introduction. Um, firstly, thanks a lot for giving up part of your Friday evening to join in. Obviously, that hopefully means you're all quite keen um, the whole premise behind this evening's tutorial or lecture is to focus on the kind of topics that traditionally medical students have found difficult, um, in particular lung cancers and kidney failures, but we'll get on to that in a second. To tell you a bit about myself, um, my name is Daniel, I recently graduated from Imperial, and in about August time I'm going to be going off to St. Thomas's Hospital to start an AFP post. So a little bit to begin with, obviously kind of a disclaimer, this teaching here is not to replace the teaching that you might get at your own medical school and obviously do not take it as medical advice. If any of you do end up with kidney failure, obviously do not refer to the PowerPoint, go see a doctor, um, but you get the idea. A few things I also wanna note before we get into the lecture, I try and avoid text heavy slides because I think during the tutorial, it's quite off-putting. All of the resources that we're gonna go through today, you'll be able to access afterwards. And although a lot of the slides have a lot of image on them, most of what I say verbally, you will find in the notes section of those PowerPoint slides. So don't feel the need to furiously copy down, copy down anything I say, because all of that will be provided afterwards. As we said, these topics are those medical students traditionally find difficult. And in fact, the reason I chose these topics, I gave a lecture like this around this time last year to some students at Imperial um, and surveyed about 100 students on what topics they found difficult. These were the topics that they answered with. Um, as this is not an in-person lecture, it's through Zoom, we'll try and make it interactive. So please, when asked to get some answers in through the chat, try your best. Basically, the more you put into the next hour, the more that you'll get back out of it. Um, I also try where possible to highlight a few tips for exam revision. Some of you might have exams in the next month, in the next couple months, so probably that's your main focus at the moment. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to start off briefly by recapping on the topic of lung cancer. For many of you, you're now reaching the end of your academic year, so I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of this. I imagine that you've come across this, across this topic at some point, but we'll then go on to is how do you differentiate between different types of lung cancer in an exam? So things like small cell lung cancer and non-small cell, which is traditionally a little bit trickier than just saying this patient has lung cancer. Lots of lung cancers can present with a perineoplastic syndrome. We'll get into what those are and how they're related afterwards. And then we'll finish off by going through renal failure, in particular, different conditions that can cause renal failure and how you might differentiate between them in an exam setting. So let's start off with lung cancers. Here is your first SBA. I'm gonna give you about a minute now to read over it and note down your thoughts, note down what you think the answer might be. And in a second, I will put up the poll for you and then you can get your answers in. If anything doesn't make sense, by all means, write something down in the chat and I can answer as you comment. But if that's been about a minute, let's start our first poll then. So should be coming up on your screen now if you get your answers in.
Right, five, four, three, two, one. Let's end polling. So let's have a look at the results. We're not going to go through the answer immediately, but we'll come back to this question after we've revised these topics. Majority answer here is squamous cell. But in fact, actually, the answer to this question is adenocarcinoma. Um, but when we come back to that, hopefully you'll see why. All of the questions today are designed to be difficult. It is the topic of the tutorial. So if you found that tricky, you're meant to. OK, and we'll do one more question then. Again. You can have a read through. CT cap means chest, CT, chest, abdo, pelvis. Same answer options again, but obviously a different case. And make a note of your answer then, and I'll bring up the next poll. Okay, get your answers in. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so again, let's have a look at the results. This time, majority answer is the correct one. This was a small cell carcinoma. Again, don't worry at the moment why that is, but if you find this difficult, that's the whole point of this question. It's here to challenge you. We'll come back to it later once we've been over the relevant content. Okay, so where to start. Lung cancer, as we said, we firstly want to just revise how lung cancer might present. Now, in your head, you probably have a typical idea of a patient presenting to their GP or the emergency department with a lung malignancy. Just to make it a bit more interactive, let's firstly check what you all know yourselves. Please post in the chat box different ways that you think a lung cancer might present. So any symptoms that a patient might have, any signs. So Andre said hemoptysis, yep. A lot of hemoptysis, short of breath. What was the answer to the SBA? We'll come back to the other SBAs, don't worry about that. A cough, yep, definitely. Weight loss, so some of your typical cancer symptoms, yep, weight loss, fevers, night sweats. Good. So getting quite a lot of those there. So already from the chat, you'll see that there is a range of ways that lung cancer might present. Horner syndrome, that's a really interesting one, and we'll come on to that in a little bit. Brachial plexus, so that's quite similar to your Horner syndrome. Um, SIADH, so some people getting into the paraneoplastic stuff. If some of you are sat there thinking, I don't know what any of this means, don't worry, we'll get onto it in a second. But great. So hold it there for a second, everyone. Let's see how many of those you manage to get. So shortness of breath. If you have cancer in your lungs, eventually your lungs will, snot, will stop working properly and therefore you will not oxygenate yourself appropriately, you'll get shorter breath. As cancer grows in the lungs, it will irritate the airways, giving you a cough, and eventually it will start to invade the local arteries and veins, and that's why you might get some hemoptysis or if it invades the nerves around your chest, you might actually get some chest pain. Common colds. So I'll get into a second kind of the relation to infections, but a lot of you in the chat there mentioned constitutional symptoms. So things like your weight loss, your general fatigue, your night sweats. So that's not just applicable to lung cancer, but a lot of malignancies as a whole. Hoarseness. 
So if, it, if you find that the lung cancer was to invade the recurrent laryngeal nerve, you might get a hoarse voice. Dysphagia, so depending on where the cancer is, as it grows, it might actually compress the esophagus. Quite an important one is pneumonia. So what you'll find with patients presenting with pneumonia, normally six weeks after their symptoms are resolved, they need a chest x-ray. And that's firstly important because it helps show resolution of the pneumonia. But also you have to think, why did that patient get pneumonia in the first place? So imagine you had malignancy in the lungs. As it grows, it can compress on a bronchiole. And if it does that, it stops the ventilation to a particular part of the lung. And as you stop that ventilation, things can't get in, things can't get out. So it firstly might create the kind of environment that's just right for certain types of bacteria to grow in. But also it stops you clearing mucus, it stops you clearing out that section of your lung until eventually you might get pneumonia. So it's always quite important to check, especially in more elderly patients who present with pneumonia, if there's any underlying malignancy that might have been the reason they got that in the first place. And then of course, as lung cancers metastasize, they might spread to bone, they might spread to the liver, and so you might get symptoms related to that. So for example, jaundice or bone pain. Now, that was our first point of today. Coming into today's tutorial, this is the sort of stuff that at this point in the year, I don't expect you to know everything on the list, but to at least know the key things. Most of us probably know that lung cancer presents with cough, coughing up blood, weight loss, etc. Now that we've covered that, we're gonna get into the slightly trickier things, the more difficult stuff. And that is lung cancer has quite a few different types. This diagram gives you a summary of kind of the demographics of what percentage is each type. And importantly, you'll find that different types of lung cancer have different risk factors and may present differently as well. So an easy or a medium style exam question might be one that we've just done. Patient comes in with cough, they're coughing up blood, they've lost weight. And the answer is they've got lung cancer. Now a difficult question might be something similar, but just like the SBAs earlier, would instead look at, well, what type of lung cancer do they have? And traditionally, people have kind of split it in two. You've got small cell lung cancers and your non-small cell. But within non-small cell, you can see that there's lots of other types there as well. So how this kind of relates to exam technique, lung cancers and differentiating between them is a very good example of how you should be putting information into your head. At this point in the year, a lot of you are probably cramming a lot for your exams and you're putting in loads of information every day. Now, a lot of that will just go out the other end. That's the same for everyone. But the way you put the information in your head is important. So you might be thinking, what on earth has this image got to do with anything? So the idea here is when you're going over a topic, always think to yourself, how is this examinable? If, it's, if you can't imagine a question testing that knowledge, it's probably not that likely it will turn up in your exam because it's hard to test. If you find that a certain topic, there's lots of ways that examiners might look at it, then it's probably a good thing to go over. If some of you are coming to this tutorial and thinking, okay, I don't know a lot about any of this stuff, always start with what's common. So before going on to how you differentiate between lung cancers, firstly, make sure you're getting right the questions of, oh, this patient has lung cancer in the first place. But then if you're trying to push yourself into that kind of merit and distinction territory, what you're wanting to think about is, well, what differentiates this topic from this one? I'm putting all this information into my head, but what is the stuff that will allow me to tell it's this and not this? And that's the whole point of this image here, that you've got two bits of fruit in front of you, which one's an apple, which one's an orange. Sounds silly, but that's the sort of way that you wanna be looking at your exam questions and your revision. So applying that kind of principle to lung cancers, what factors are important? So firstly, demographics. Are we looking at male, female? Are they a smoker, a non-smoker? On the whole, most lung cancers will have similar risk factors. As you can imagine, smoking is one of the strongest. But equally, you've got age, but the age in itself is not really gonna allow us to differentiate between anything. So going back to what we've just said, 
cramming into your head the average age of someone with lung cancer is not that helpful for your exams. But knowing that some are more related with smoking than others is. Location, what does that mean? So where actually in the lung will you find it? Will it be quite central, located near the bronchioles, the bronchi, or will you find it peripherally at the edge of the lung? And then behavior. You'll find that some lung cancers metastasize quite early and some metastasize a little bit later. And then finally, we'll get onto those perineoplastic syndromes. Some particular types of lung cancer, in particular small cell, can secrete different hormones different molecules that can go on and produce their own combination of symptoms in their own right. So let's start with squamous cell. So we're gonna go through all of the non-small cell first, and then we'll get onto small cell, because like we said, that's a category and it's all right. But squamous cell, as you'll see on the diagram, let's start with location. Where do you find it? So you'll see here, that it's typically found near your bronchi. And imagine that the bronchi are lay, lined with squamous epithelium, and therefore they have the tendency to mutate into a squamous cell carcinoma. Image on the right, you can imagine lung cancer is associated with smoking. Squamous cell is a typical example of that. So we think of squamous cell, one very strong risk factor being smoking, another one being male. Now, does it metastasize early? Does it metastasize late? you'll typically find that it metastasizes a bit later than the rest. So already you've got a set of factors that if they turn up in an SBA question, start to point you towards squamous cell. Located centrally, male associated with smoking and metastasizing a little bit later. Now, adenocarcinoma is almost the complete opposite of that. You'll see on the diagram, location-wise, adenocarcinoma is found a bit more peripherally. I don't think the diagram shows it that well, but normally adenocarcinoma will be found more in the lung lobes themselves. Who gets it? Females. Obviously, men can get adeno as well, but it's more strongly associated with women. And of all the lung cancers, it's the one that is least associated with smoking. And this will tie into that SBA question that we did earlier. Like I said, it's kind of the opposite of squamous. Squamous metastasized late, so adeno, unfortunately, metastasizes early. Again, do note these down if you wish, but they'll all be included in the comments section of the slides. Small cell then. Small cell, why people like to go on about it is because it's probably a bit more interesting than the other types of lung cancer, and that's because it ties in these perineoplastic syndromes. Why is it called small cell? Quite simple. If you look at it, look at it under the microscope, the cells look small. That's it. It's in the name. Where will you find it? Some, it's another example of where you'll find it quite centrally near the bronchi. Also associated with smoking, also more typically found in men. And we talked about perineoplastic syndromes. So this photo here on the right is an example. In the chat, feel free to comment which perineoplastic syndrome you think that might be. Any ideas? So we've got a few examples there, lots and lots of examples of perineoplastics, and the right answer for that is carcinoid. So with carcinoid syndrome, you typically get facial flushing. That's what the question is showing. But don't worry, we'll go through all of those different perineoplastics in a second. Now, large cell is one that was in the diagram earlier. And this is a little bit debatable. Some people kind of argue that this doesn't exist. Some people would say, oh, if it doesn't fit into the three beforehand, we'll put it in this category. But we believe that maybe about five to 10% are this type of lung cancer. Compared to the rest, don't spend too much time on this. It rarely features in exam questions because we don't know too much about it. The main thing that we do know is it has the potential to secrete beta HCG. So in men, that can lead to gynecomastia, man boobs. So that's probably the main thing that you need to know if it ever did feature in a question. So those are your kind of histological types of lung cancer. And at the end of the day, you've got those different factors. The way you're actually going to diagnose it in real life is you're going to get a biopsy. 
But in your exam, when they're presenting and they've got those different factors, are they a smoker or a non-smoker? Are they male or female? Whereabouts is the lung cancer found? And any of the other additional symptoms that we've mentioned, that will help you kind of at least reach a differential diagnosis. Now, we've got an x-ray here, obviously, and this is about to bring out another key learning point. Anyone have any idea what the problem is in this x-ray? Again, feel free to comment in the chat. So like the person in caps, there is a mass in the right apex. So yes, that's a good place to start. Definitely, we've got an opacity in the right apex. As we're on the topic of cancers, you can probably guess it's cancer. So yes, quite a few of you are right, this is a pancose tumor. So this is something that you'll hear about occasionally. Pancose tumors are lungs found at the apex. Often, most often they're squamous cell. Yes, the hemidiaphragm is raised a little bit. It may be because of the cancer there pulling things upwards. But the main thing just to focus on is you've got a pancose tumor. Now, an image to go with that, another spot diagnosis. What is wrong with this person here? The top right hand corner. So someone said ptosis, good. So first you've described what you can see. They've got a drooping left eyelid. And if you look at the pupil, the pupil is smaller on the left. So yeah, this is consistent with Horner's. Why is that important? So anyone know the connection here? You can again comment in the chat. Yeah, nerve compression. So you'll find that your sympathetic nerve supply strangely starts in your brain, works its way down the neck, and will come out around the apices of the lungs and then goes back up via the carotids and then back up to supply the eyes. So if you compress your sympathetic supply at any point, you get a hornus. Pancos tumors, because they are at the apex, they will compress the sympathetic supply. So a common way or a classical way that they might present is with Horner syndrome. But the other thing nearby that they can also get into and compress is the brachial plexus. I'm not gonna go into the brachial plexus. I hate it. I don't really think I know anyone who likes the brachial plexus. There's a lot going on there, but what kind of syndrome might that give you? If you're gonna invade the brachial plexus, you're gonna damage the nerves, you're gonna get lower motor neuron signs. So you're gonna get wasting of those muscles potentially in the arm or in the hands. You're gonna get some weakness. You might get paresthesia as well. So pancoast is more about where the lung cancer is rather than what type, but often we find it's squamous cell out of all those that exist. So that was pancoast. Back to your paraneoplastics. Why is this an important thing to study? For your own benefit, Perineoplastics allow you to kind of cover a lot of ground at once. A lot of perineoplastic syndromes are conditions in their own right that you have probably studied elsewhere. And when it comes to effective revision, you want to target overlapping topics. So perineoplastic syndromes are a great example. You're not only revising lung cancers, but you're also revising all of these conditions as well. Someone's just asked, can you get a bovine cough with a pancoast? So if it was to grow large enough to invade your recurrent laryngeal nerve, yes, potentially. But that it's not just a pancoast, it could be others as well. So perineoplastics. Again, just to get a bit of interaction, please post some perineoplastic syndromes you're aware of. We've already mentioned one carcinoid. So we got quite a nice mixture here. And people are talking about these in two different ways. So you could either talk about the syndrome, so the set of symptoms that you get, or some of you have talk, actually talked about the molecule that is being secreted. So as you can see on the screen, perineoplastic syndromes are symptoms you get due to neuroendocrine tumors. So neuroendocrine cells in the lungs when they become malignant, they can start to secrete different hormones and different molecules. 
which can go on and have their own symptoms and their own effects. And those may be molecules like ADH, it might be PTHRP, ACTH, so a lot of you mentioned many of them here in the chat, and then those will go on to give you particular presentations, such as Cushing syndrome, Lambert-Eden, SIADH. So think about how, kind of how you could categorize. You can categorize it by the molecules secreted or by the set of symptoms that crop up. So this is not an exhaustive list, but these are probably the most common ones that you'd encounter. Again, quite a long list. I'll bring up a few examples just to illustrate what each one is. Things like Cushing syndrome and SIADH you've probably come across before. But things like Lambert-Eaton, myasthenic syndrome, that is maybe perhaps a little bit more niche. So some of these you may know, some of these you might not. So where do we start? This image at the, on the top left, which of those from the previous list is this the typical presentation of? Yeah, loads of people jumped in there with Cushing's. So you have a lot of phrases for Cushing's nowadays that we're not really allowed to say, kind of like your, your buffalo hump, your lemon on sticks appearance. Those are not the sort of things you want to be saying because obviously telling someone they've got a buffalo hump is quite offensive. You wouldn't be surprised by that. But you can see things like the striae here. You can see the central obesity. And if you've got lots of additional cortisol, how does that relate to the image at the bottom left? Good, exactly. So when you think about lung cancer earlier, we said you typically think about it as someone who presents with hemoptysis. But you can already see that actually there's quite a few steps that could get you to that lung cancer. You may have an old lady come in because she's fallen over and she's had a neck of femur fracture. So she gets a hip replacement. They then find that she's got osteoporosis. So the doctors start thinking, well, why has she got osteoporosis? And then they notice that actually she's got this kind of cushionoid appearance. Then they start thinking, well, why has she got a cushionoid appearance? Perhaps it is a perineoplastic syndrome. So this is why it's a really good exam question to set people because there's so many different ways that you could look at lung cancer. Looking at some of the others, ADH, so this is a really good diagram from Kiki, Kiki Medics. SIADH is the syndrome where you have too much of it. And you think what ADH does, it's antidiuretic, it's to stop diuresis, to stop urinating. So it makes you hold on to more fluid, but what that results often in is a hyponatremia. So actually you might get some of the lung cancer and the presentation this time would be a set of bloods and they're hyponatremic. Someone's saying, okay, what's the difference between Cushing's and Cushingoid? Cushingoid, so oid is just an ending that means like. So if you ever see oid at the end of something, it means, okay, they have an appearance that looks like Cushing's. Now, obviously a lot of people are obese. So you could say quite a lot of people are Cushingoid, but until you do the tests, you can't confirm they have Cushing's. So when we say Cushingoid appearances, they have that typical kind of central obesity. And good, Fred, good question here. How do you talk about a buffalo hump in a polite way? Supraclavicular fat pads, yeah, that's probably the best you're going to get or increased facial diameter. There's probably no nicer way to say it. Um, yeah, but thank you very much, for Tiffany, for that. That was a very good addition. Um, now, back to that point then. So Cushionoid, they look like they have Cushing's, but Cushing's you're going to have to confirm with a test, with typically a blood test. And in the bottom right here, those symptoms of sweaty, shaking, irritable, what perineoplastic syndrome do you think that might be? What or what molecule, what hormone do you think might be getting secreted? So someone said ACTH. Remember, ACTH is what will give you Cushing's because it'll make you release cortisol. So someone said glucose. Good, exactly. Related to glucose, but not glucose itself you might actually have insulin secreted. So one perineoplastic syndrome, it's an insulinoma, you release insulin and think what insulin does, it drives down the glucose in your blood, it makes you hypoglycemic. 
So this is someone with the typical signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. As for the other half, top left, we looked at this photo earlier. This is cost night. So this is where you've got ectopic serotonin secretion. What does that do? Okay, it leads to things like facial flushing, headaches, diarrhea, vomiting. So it has a quite a typical way that it might present. Bottom left, any thoughts on what's going on in that bottom left photo? What condition is that? Any ideas? Oh, I need to scroll down, I'm missing them. Good, dermatomyositis. So think it's in the name, dermato skin, you've got a skin rash. Myo, muscle, itis, inflammation. Why exactly this happens, I can't really tell you. I'm not too sure of the underlying etiology and exactly what the lung cancer is secreting. Perhaps ask a rheumatologist, but looking and doing a bit of research on the topic, there is no consensus as to why these patients get dermatomyositis from their lung cancer, but they're releasing some sort of molecule that's giving them inflammation and pain in their muscles alongside this typical rash. Then our top right diagram here, this is your Lambert-Eden myasthenic syndrome. So there's quite a lot to unpack. So start with myasthenic syndrome. That relates to myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis, neurological condition, and the typical presentation of myasthenia is that your muscles fatigue with use. Lambert-Eaton is kind of like the opposite of that. So with Lambert-Eaton, the problem is that you have these antibodies here. Where have they come from? Well, in this example, because it's paraneoplastic, the lung cancer is secreting these antibodies. And the antibodies target the voltage gated channels on your neurons at the synapse. And you think normally voltage gated channels, you'd get an impulse come in, the voltage gated channels would sense this, influx of calcium, you secrete your neurotransmitter, and then your muscle contracts. The problem this time is you have these antibodies directed at the voltage gated channels, and that stops them from opening, stops the calcium coming in, and stops the muscle contracting. So a little bit like myasthenia, they have muscle weakness. But the difference here is instead of fatiguing with use, it actually gets better with use. And it's quite logical if you think about it, the more you try and use the muscle, the more impulses that get sent down this axon, the more it, impulses coming from your brain telling that muscle to move. And as you get repeated stimuli, eventually some of the voltage gated channels open until finally the neurotransmitter will get released. So Lambert Eden, fatigable, you've got fatigability just like myasthenia, but whereas myasthenia will get worse over time, the more you use your muscles, Lambert Eden gets better. And then finally then, image in the bottom right here, note down in the comments what you think that might be. Good. Acanthosis nigricans. What exactly is that? So it's this hyperpigmentation of the skin, typically at the skin folds. So often that might be the neck, it might be in the armpits. Why do patients get this? So there is some literature suggesting that it might be because the cancer is secreting TGF, tissue growth factor. But again, you'll find that on a lot of these topics, okay, carcinoid or ACTH, we have quite a clear idea of what's going on. But some of the stuff like tomatomyositis, acanthosis nigricans, we know it exists, but we're not fully sure why. Again, there are probably people out there who can tell you in much more detail. The main thing you need to know for your exams is that these are ways lung cancers can present. But for all of them that we've just mentioned, just to double check again, reinforce what we're doing, which particular type of lung cancer is it that we associate all of these with? Note down in the comments. Good, small cell. So small cell is the one you typically associate with all of these perineoplastics. The only one on the list from earlier, is it on the list? No. So there's one that some of you have mentioned in 
the chat earlier, which is PTHRP. So that is PTH related peptide. It's basically a protein, a peptide that resembles PTH. And you think, what does PTH do? PTH draws calcium out of your bones. It brings up the calcium level in your blood. So anyone know where PTHRP is normally found? You can note down in the comments if you do. It's not something you're typically taught. So PTH is from the parathyroid, but yes, a few of you are right. PTHRP is from a fetus. And it's a little bit like a horror movie when you think about it, but it's also quite interesting. Normally, PTHRP is secreted by an embryo. And what it does is it crosses the placenta, goes into the mother, and it steals her calcium. It steals her bones to make bones for the baby. Interesting, but a little bit scary when you think about it too much. So obviously, once you're born, that's switched off. There is no need for PTHRP. But with malignant cells, they can obviously switch on genes that had previously been switched off, and this is one of them. So lung cancers can switch on the PTHRP molecule, make that PTHRP, and it has the same effect as PTH. It drives up your calcium. So you might have talked about cancers presenting with hypercalcemia. So this is typically with lung cancers why that is often the case, because they release PTHRP. But why I've kept it separate, all of these so far we've said relate to your small cell. PTHRP is typically actually squamous cell. So that is kind of it for lung cancers. This nice table here summarizes most of what we said and adds in a few extra things that we haven't really got time for today but things that you may have come across elsewhere. So SVC syndrome, um, your superior vena cava syndrome, one of the presentation of lung cancer, especially when it gets quite late stage, is it might get so big that it compresses your superior vena cava, stops blood from getting back to the heart. And so you get lots of engorged blood vessels running all the way up your face and also breathing difficulties at the same time. But we've said small cell, think of all your paraneoplastics, Squamous cell, though, that's where you get the hypercalcemia or your pancoast, as we talked about the other ways things might present. So we said earlier, when you're revising, high yield topics are topics where there's a lot of overlap. So you think about lung cancer, why it's a high yield topic. We said earlier it overlaps with pneumonia. That's one way it will present. All of these perineoplastic syndromes, so a lot of endocrinology, a bit of rheumatology, horners, brachial plexus injuries, so it starts to bring in some neuro as well or it can give you a hoarse voice when it invades the recurrent laryngeal nerve, or it might obstruct the superior vena cava syndrome. So that's when you've got your oncology emergencies. So that's why it's a good topic to explore and try and do that when you're going through your own revision. So say personally, this time last year, I was preparing for my specialty exams, but I also had a path exam as well. And one topic in the path exam was microbiology, in particular, STDs. But that year as well, I was also doing gynecology, which obviously covers STDs. And that meant that almost every exam I sat, that was a topic that could potentially turn up. And so it was really important to know that topic well, because it was probably going to feature in quite a lot of places. So try to do the same with your own exams. Find out where there's overlap and make sure that you prioritize some time into that overlap. So going back to our first SBA, a lot of us here went for squamous, but as we said, the answer actually is adeno. So to revise what we've just talked about, we said adenocarcinoma, more common in women. She was a social smoker in her 20s, but hasn't smoked for over 20 years. So that's suggesting that really she has a very minimal smoking history. Yes, okay, she may be underplaying it, but if she hasn't smoked for over 20 years, it means that at most she was smoking for around 10 years. So Typical of adenocarcinoma, non-smokers, women. And we said adeno is found peripherally in the left lower lobe in this example, whereas squamous or small cell would be found more centrally next to the bronchi. The occasional jaundice, what do we think that's hinting at? Anyone wanna put in the comments? Yeah, metastases, exactly. It's metastasized the liver, so lung cancer typically metastasizes via the blood, and one place it might go is the liver, 
liver stops working, you get jaundice. So if anyone has any questions about SBA1, obviously note it down, but let's quickly then go over SBA2. So for this one, this example was small cell, why? Okay, in this question, we've got a male, he's a smoker. So already it's pointing more towards adeno or small cell. And we do the CT chest abdo pelvis. The lesion is adjacent to the right main bronchus. So already, as we've said, it's narrowing it down to either option A or option C, squamous cell or small cell, because of where it is and the demographics. But what ultimately makes us go for small cell is looking at the question, the facial flushing. And that's pointing towards that perineoplastic syndrome, the carcinoid. So that is lung cancer done. So that's the first half of today's tutorial. If you manage to keep up with that, fantastic. We're all gonna park that to one side now. And for the second half, we're gonna go on to renal failure. There's a few things in this to think about. And I'd say probably for most, it's a lot harder than the lung cancers because if you start going into the causes of renal failure, there is a very, very long list. And each of these topics you could spend an hour on in their own right. The point of the next 30 minutes, we're gonna focus a lot more on different types of kidney failure and how you differentiate between them. And not every single fact out there about glomerulonephritis or TTP or all of these weird and wacky renal diseases. We'll try and concentrate on the single kind of key bits of info that might help you point towards them in an exam question. So here's your next SBA. Take about 45 seconds to read it over and then we'll bring up the poll for you to have a go. Okay, let's bring up our poll, poll then and get your answers in. Three, two, one, end poll. So most common one here is a post-renal AKI. I can kind of see why you've gone for that, but actually the answer is acute interstitial nephritis. Difficult, again, just like we did with lung cancer, we'll go over the information and then we'll come back to this so that you can start to fit together the pieces of the jigsaw. Right, let's get rid of that. And we'll give you one more SBA to have a read through of this then. Okay, let's bring up your poll. Get your answers in then. Three, two, one. So perhaps this was the hardest question of today. Most common answer then was post-strep glomerulonephritis. 
In fact, the answer was amyloidosis. So for the one in 10 of you who went for that, fantastic. Like I said, these are the kind of questions that are pushing you into that merit and distinction territory. So if you found it difficult, you're meant to. The whole point is take away what we're gonna go over in the next 20 minutes or so, come back to it. Hopefully everything will make a lot more sense and it will show you the kind of way that you wanna be putting this information into your head. Okay, so renal failure, what are we gonna be looking at? Well, the way you can break it down, you can think about renal failure first in an acute presentation or an AKI, acute kidney injury. And then of course you can categorize that into the different causes. Is it pre-renal, renal, post-renal? Post -renal? And then you can think about your chronic kidney disease. Most of today's tutorial is gonna focus on the acute stuff because chronic is a huge topic in itself. But then, I think where a lot of people get confused is you hear about things like nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome. And the first time you hear about them, you think, okay, this is great. But then people start to bring in more causes of kidney disease. They start to bring in more treatments, investigations, until eventually it all muddles together and you can't remember any of it. What I would say is acute and chronic kidney failure, they are conditions or they are problems with the kidney and there are different causes for them. Nephrotic and nephritic syndrome, these are ways that the causes of the failure may present itself. Nephrotic typically we associate with protein in the urine. Nephritic we associate with blood in the urine. But there's a bit more than that and we'll get into it. So immediately, just before we get into it, think about it that way. Acute and chronic are the conditions themselves, but nephrotic and nephritic syndromes are the ways that these conditions might present. Hopefully that'll make more sense in a bit. So starting with the acute stuff, what is acute kidney injury? You've got this definition here. Typically, we think about acute kidney injury. Most of the time, it's a patient in the hospital. And for some reason, their creatinine and their urea have increased compared to their previous blood test. Why do we worry about it? Because if we don't do anything about acute kidney injury, eventually, it will become chronic. Eventually, it will go into renal failure. And you can see there's quite a long list of the complications of kidney injury or kidney failure as a whole. I'd say for this list here, this is a good example where if you know your pathophysiology, if you know how the kidney works, you know your physiology, it makes a lot more sense. If you know what the kidney does, then logically you can deduce what will happen when it doesn't work. The kidney gets rid of protons, get rid of acid. So if it stops working, you get an acidosis. It gets rid of potassium, so you get hyperkalemia. It gets rid of urea, so if it stops working, lots of urea in the blood. It gets rid of excess fluid, so if the kidney stops working, you're overloaded with fluid. So things like pulmonary edema might be one way it could present. Kidneys get rid of phosphate, so unsurprisingly, high phosphate. The kidney helps you with calcium handling, so if it stops working, low calcium. Or you might think about the renin angiotensin system used to regulate your blood pressure. And if that goes faulty, then you get hypertension, but that might be a bit more late stage. In the initial stages, you might worry about more kind of your electrolytes and things like that. So at the side as well, you'll see kind of a quick indicator of the causes. Why do we categorize the causes? Like most things in medicine, we categorize them because it gives you a structure, it gives you something logical and a way to think through a presentation, which we'll come on to. But as we said, why we care about it in the first place, if we don't do anything, eventually this progresses and the patient may end up with permanent kidney disease. That is not the topic of today's lecture. You can obviously go away and read about that in your own time. We're gonna focus more on the acute stuff and how you differentiate your causes, but obviously there's a lot of overlap. So first thing to start with the pre-renal. These diagrams here are from Osmosis. You might have been through their videos on kidney failure before. If you haven't, there'll be a link at the bottom. Definitely do that. They have some really nice, really well explained diagrams on pre-renal, renal, post-renal. Post um, pre-renal though, we think about there's a problem with the blood supply to the kidney. And as the diagram shows, you can categorize into one of two things. It's either, there just isn't enough blood, the blood is gone. So for example, a hemorrhage, 
Or if we think more broadly about fluids, you've lost fluids because you may have vomited them, you might have lost them through a burn, or the fluid has gone somewhere else in the body. That could be edema, so it could be cardiac failure, it's all pooled in your legs, or it might be something like pancreatitis, where you get third spacing, where you lose a lot of fluid into your peritoneum. And the kidney is one of the most metabolically active parts of your body. It needs about 15 to 20% of your blood supply. So a fifth of your blood supply goes to the kidney. And that means it's one of the first things to go wrong when your blood supply drops. And that's often why it's quite common in the hospital. Patients get dehydrated. And that might be because, okay, they picked up a bug in the hospital. They've got C. diff. It might be because they haven't had ad adequate fluid replacement, and suddenly they've got a pre-renal AKI. So on the left here, we've kind of got the typical pre-renal causes. So we talked about hypovolemia, blood loss, could be from trauma, could be from anything else. Sepsis. So with sepsis, the issue there, not so much you've got a loss of blood, but you don't have enough peripheral resistance, so the kidney's not getting enough blood running through it each second. You're dehydrated, either because you're not drinking enough, you're not getting enough fluids. Vascular occlusion. So if you get a clot in your renal artery, that's going to stop your kidney working. And then some of the other causes we said, okay, might be more about where things are getting distributed. So cardiac failure, all of that fluid's going into your legs. Pancreatitis, it's all going into your peritoneum. And then certain drugs don't help this because things like NSAIDs will stop your kidney getting as much blood as it normally would. Now. On the whole, people are quite happy with pre-renal. It makes a lot of sense. If you don't get enough blood, the kidney stops working. What are the clues in the question? Well, obviously, if you've got any of these symptoms, if they have come in after a major car accident, you know it's probably pre-renal. It makes a lot of sense. So I'm not going to spend too long on this. I find students are generally quite happy. But what you might find often would be things from their observations. So they might be hemodynamically compromised. They've got a low blood pressure. They've got a high heart rate. They may have signs of other signs of cardiac failure, features like that. And this accounts for 60, 70% easily of your AKIs. Then about 10, 15% is your post-renal. So this is where there's a problem anywhere after the kidney itself. So this could be in the renal pelvis, it could be in the ureter, it could be in the bladder, it could be in the urethra. So what is the sort of stuff here that might go wrong? I think the best way to think about this actually is more anatomically, what could kind of create a blockage at any of these points? And this list at this side will kind of give you that. So calculi, renal stones. If a renal stone dislodges anywhere along the ureter or in the pelvis or in the urethra, you may get a post-renal AKI because you're going to have a buildup of pressure and it's going to backtrack. And if it backtracks, as you can see on the diagram, you get hydronephrosis. And it's in the name what that is. Hydro, water, like hydrates. Nephron, the kidney. And osis means presence of. That's important. That will become quite useful later on when we get onto your nephrotic syndromes. So it literally tells you in the name there is a buildup of water in the nephron. And the reason is because the water can't get out, the urine can't go anywhere. And that might be because of a kidney stone. It might be because of prostatic hyperplasia. Your prostate has, so obviously this is in men, but the prostate grows until a point at which it compresses on the outflow of urine. Or it may be because you've got prostate cancer. In women, actually cervical cancer, if it grows large enough, could have this effect. Fibrosis, and fibrosis might come about because of recurrent UTIs. It may happen because of abdominal surgery, a bit like a bowel obstruction. Neurogenic bladder, what is that? So neurogenic bladder is where the bladder itself will not empty because the nerves supplying it are not telling it to empty. But obviously that's gonna have the same sort of effect. If the bladder doesn't empty, everything builds up. So does every cause of post-renal AKI cause hydronephrosis? That's a question in the chat. Eventually. So if you were to leave a post-renal AKI, thinking about it logically, it's going to build up and up and up and up until eventually you get a hydronephrosis. Obviously, what we want to do as doctors is get in before that happens. 
So you, you can have a post-renal AKI without hydronephrosis, but the idea is if you left it long enough, then likely, yes, you would. So that's the stuff that generally people are okay with. And with post-renal, what's the main thing you want to be thinking about? So in an actual clinical setting, the main thing is you get an ultrasound because the ultrasound may show you the hydronephrosis. It may show you some of these things at the site. Obviously, renal stones, you might also have to do a CTKUB. You might have to look for it with some imaging. But post-renal, the idea here is okay that they're probably not tachycardic. Their blood pressure is probably fine. But if you do an ultrasound, you'll see the hydronephrosis. So that's the stuff that people are generally okay with. So for the last part of the lecture, then, we're going to focus on the stuff that people don't like, which is the intrinsic causes or the renal causes, where there's an issue with the kidney itself. Remember in real life that if you're an F1, you're an F2, and a patient goes into acute kidney injury, most of the time it is pre-renal. And sometimes we post-renal. And if that's the case, your ultrasound, ultrasound will show you that it's post-renal. And then you let the urologists know and the urologists deal with it. Pre-renal is probably something you can deal with. If you haven't got enough fluids, give them more fluids. Now the renal stuff, which makes up about 20%, it depends who you ask. As an F1 and F2, these are not the sort of things that you would be managing. And it's not the sort of things that a lot of medical registrars would be, read, would be managing. It's the sort of stuff that renal consultants manage. So if you have figured out your patient has an AKI and it's not pre-renal, it's not post-renal, in reality, you're gonna ring up the renal department and you're gonna tell them about your patient and then they're gonna come see your patient. So what that means is in reality, you don't need to know every single thing about all of these causes that you see down here. Yes, you may get tested on this in your exam and the more you know, the better, but that's why we're not gonna go into every single thing that you need to know about all of these. What we're gonna try and do is highlight, well, what are they? And what in an exam question might point towards each of these. Of the different causes of your renal AKIs, acute tubular necrosis is the most common. So we'll start with that. What is acute tubular necrosis? Again, there's a very good video on YouTube by osmosis on this. So we said earlier, the kidney is very metabolically active. And the part that is most metabolically active is the tubules and the cells that line the tubules. So if there is an issue with the blood supply, this is the part of the kidney that will get affected first because it needs the most blood. And typically how you get this acute tubal necrosis, if a patient has pre-renal AKI and you don't do anything, if they're not getting enough blood, eventually this is what will happen. Eventually the tubule cells, they will die because they have not got enough blood to do their job. And then they will slough off into the tubule itself and eventually pass out in the filtrate. So how can that happen? So we've just said there, the most common cause, pre-renal AKI. If you don't have enough blood going to your kidney, eventually those tubules will die and they'll slough off. But we've mentioned a few others as well. So if you get an embolism, if you get anything that's blocking the blood supply, but this time it's not really the renal artery itself, it's not the whole kidney, it's more the smaller capillaries within it. For example, the glomerulus. And then suddenly the tubules are not getting the blood that they need, they die. But the other cause here, the other category is toxins. So take contrast. You've probably heard about that contrast is not appropriate for people with kidney problems. And this is why. If you have an allergic reaction to contrast, the contrast can damage the kidney, it can damage the tubule cells. And again, it's for the same rationales, for the same reasons. These are the cells that need the most blood. And if they're getting the most blood, if you introduce a toxin, that's where the toxin's gonna go. So common ones you've got at the site, aminoglycosides, so things like gentamicin, common side effect is that it can cause acute tubular necrosis. It can give you an AKI, cisplatin. So cisplatin is used in oncology. It's a chemotherapy drug, but one of the problems is it can give you kidney issues. Rhabdomyolysis. So we think about rhabdomyolysis, it's again, it's in the name, myo muscle, lysis breakdown. 
the classical presentation is an old lady's fallen over. She's been on the floor for several hours. And as a result, her muscles break down. And the myoglobin that's released is, is toxic to the kidney. It damages it. What it can also do, if we go back to a previous diagram, is the myoglobin can actually get stuck in the tubules itself and obstruct the tubules. So that's one other effect of rhabdomyolysis. So that's a key tubular necrosis. As we said, the main thing that I want you to take away is, well, how are you identifying in the question? The key thing is, if you look at the urine, you'll find brown cell casts. What are those? Well, we said the cells die, they slough off, and they enter the tubule, and it passes out through your urine. So if someone's having an AKI, you do want to do a urine dip. It's one of the first things you'll do. But what you then might do is you might send off the urine for MCNS. And you probably most of the time think about that as, oh, I'm going to look for bacteria in the urine. But within MCNS, you've got cytology. So they're going to look under the microscope at the urine and they're going to look for cells. And this is one thing they might find, brown cell casts. And that basically is the remnant of these tubules. The tubules have died, they've entered the urine, and that's what you might be looking at under the microscope. So that's your kind of key phrase to associate with that. Now, that's a key tubular necrosis. That's the most common one. As for the others then, again, let's quickly go into, will the tubules regenerate? Remember what we said earlier, why we care about AKI is if you get to it in time, you can do something. The kidney does have the potential to regenerate. So if you get there and you do something, okay, you might lose some of your kidney function, but you might get back some of it as well. AKI is not permanent. But if you wait too long, then you will miss that stage. That's why it's important to do something about it. So will the tubules regenerate? It depends how long you wait. Acute interstitial nephritis. So again, let's think anatomically. We've just talked about the tubules, the cells that line the nephron. Acute interstitial nephritis, we're now thinking about the interstitium. We're thinking about everything in between the tubules. So that might be, say, in the renal medulla. And nephritis, I just means inflammation. You have inflammation in the interstitium. Why is that? Because immune cells get into the interstitium and, and activate an inflammatory process. And the immune cells involved may be neutrophils, they may be xenophils. I'll get into when each one will appear. But broadly speaking, it, this can either be due to an infection. So you get an infection within the kidney and obviously, if there's an infection in the kidney, immune cells come in, but that inflammation will damage the kidney and you get kidney failure. Or alternatively, these immune cells might actually be targeting something that you've taken because they're looking at it as an allergen and they're targeting and you're getting an allergic reaction. So certain things that says at the side here, like NSAIDs, penicillins, Acute interstitial nephritis might, in fact, actually be where you've got these immune cells undergoing allergic reaction against these, these medicines, against NSAIDs, penicillins, etc., And that's what's giving you the issue. So it's an inflammatory process targeting the renal interstitium. And as we said, it could either be infective. Most commonly, this would be pyelonephritis. So think about UTIs. Typically with a UTI, someone presents with dysuria, they present with frequency, urgency to urinate, but as that bacteria migrates up the ureters, up the urethra, bladder, ureters, eventually it may get to the kidney and give you pyelonephritis. And then if you've got an infection in the kidney, in come the white cells, in particular neutrophils, and you get acute interstitial nephritis. And then the clue for that then, go back to what we said earlier, what happens if you look at the urine? Well, if you've got all these white cells hanging around in the kidney, some of them will get out into the urine itself. You look at the urine under the microscope and you see white cell casts. So these are the remnants of your white blood cells. But then your non-infective causes, we said normally this is some sort of hypersensitivity reaction. So things like antibiotics or diuretics, and think about your typical blood cells associated with allergic reactions. That's normally in a xenophil. So what you might find here in the blood is that someone's got an xenophilia. 
because there's some sort of allergic reaction going on. At the end of the day, how are you going to confirm it? For most of these renal causes, you need to take a biopsy. You can't just say, oh, it's probably this because they've got white cell casts. In an exam question, yeah, that's fine. But in reality, what are they going to do? They're going to biopsy. But think about acute interstitial nephritis, inflammation and in interstitial, either from an infection or some sort of allergic reaction. In your clues, your white cell casts or your xenophilia. Now, let's get into a massive topic in itself, glomerulonephritis. This could have been the entire lecture if we wanted it to be. But just to go very briefly, glomerulonephritis in the name, you have inflammation of the glomerulus and the nephron. And there are loads of conditions that can give you this. But the idea is that there is some sort of inflammatory process. It could be complement. It could be actual antibodies targeting the glomerulus, targeting the nephron, leading to inflammation. And if the glomerulus is inflamed, it doesn't work properly. If it doesn't work properly, you get kidney failure. And this is where your nephrotic and your nephritic syndromes come in. So here are some acronyms that might help you remember each one. But again, if you just try and think about it logically, the problem with nephrotic syndrome, the glomerulus is not working. And as a result, protein leaks out. Normally, the glomerulus filters out certain molecules, but protein doesn't leave. The fenestrations in the glomerulus are not large enough to let out protein. But the inflammation damages the glomerulus and protein gets out. So you get proteinuria, very logical. Most of that protein is albumin. That's the main protein in your blood. So you get hypoalbuminemia. Again, quite logical. And then if you don't have a lot of albumin, you lose oncotic pressure. Normally albumin draws water into the blood vessels and leaves them out of the tissue fluid. So if you don't have that oncotic pressure, you can't draw water back in. So you become edematous. So typically that's what we think about with nephrotic syndrome. They're losing a lot of albumin and therefore they're edematous. And then also strangely, they get hyperlipidemia as well. Now, nephritic syndrome, similarly, you've got some inflammation in the kidney, but you don't get as much protein. The main thing that you get here is blood. And as we said, these are presentations. These are not conditions in themselves. These are ways that different types of glomerular nephritis might present. And the way that I normally think about it, let's go back to what we said earlier, hydronephrosis. So nephrosis means in the nephron, it's present in the nephron. So when I look at nephrotic syndrome, the way I think about it is there is an issue because something is present in the nephron. There is some sort of molecule, some sort of compound in the nephron that's creating a problem. It's damaging the barrier and letting out the protein. Whereas nephritis, nephritic, there is inflammation. Itis indicates inflammation. And because there's inflammation, you've got actual damage going on much more than you would say for nephrotic. And that damage is letting out blood. It's letting out a bit of protein, not as much. It's letting out some red blood cells, which get damaged and become red cell casts. But then also you get a few things because the kidney is not working itself. Azotemia just means you've got nitrogen containing products in the blood. So the most common one would be urea, but also creatinine. And also your kidney is not working, so you're not urinating or you're producing very little urine. So that's how I suggest that you look at it. You've got nephrosis, presence of, so there's something present in the kidneys. Nephritic syndrome, there's some sort of inflammation going on. But in reality, to make it even more complicated for us, you find that it's on a spectrum. So it's not the case that conditions present with one or the other. But you'll find that some conditions typically present with a lot more of one than they do the other. So some conditions typically will present with nephritic syndrome, nephritis. So you can see that all of this stuff at the side here, diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis, crescentic glomerular nephritis, it's in the name, nephritis, therefore nephritic. Then have a look at the nephrotic side, and we're not really seeing that. But a lot of the stuff could be a bit of both. So in fact, there's a diagram next. This is just talking about what we described, and I think it's a lot more helpful. 
But nephritic, think there's inflammation going on. Nephrotic, there is something present in the nephron or the glomerulus creating a structural problem. You'll hear people talking about it either as primary or secondary. Primary, all that means is it's an issue with the kidney itself. The problem has arisen in the kidney. It's an issue with the kidney. Secondary means there was a problem elsewhere in the body, and that has led to an issue in the kidney. So a really good example of this would be diabetes. So in the comments here, quickly post, do you think diabetes is going to present with a nephritic picture or a nephrotic picture? About a 50-50 split. Do you think diabetes, what do you have? You've got too much sugar in your blood. And that sugar is going to get to the kidneys. Because yes, you're perfectly right, um, whoever is QE, you're going to have glucose deposited in your nephron. So you're typically going to get diabetic nephropathy because you've got a nephrotic picture. You've got glucose there. And then secondly, then, is this primary or secondary? What do you think? Yeah, secondary. Because the problem didn't start with the kidney. It started with the pancreas, started with the body itself, which then led to a secondary issue in the kidney. So this diagram is quite nice. Again, you've got that spectrum of nephrotic on the left, nephritic on the right. And you'll see that the stuff on the right is a lot more inflammatory and the stuff on the left is a lot more structural. So we just mentioned there diabetic nephropathy. What is FSGS? That's focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. If you think sclerosis, you've got hardening of the glomerulus. So again, don't worry too much about that. I don't want to go into all of these topics today because it's a bit overloading. But all of this stuff on the left is pointing towards there is a structural issue with the kidney. Whereas all of this stuff on the right is pointing towards an inflammatory issue with the kidney. And that might be because, okay, let's look at anti-GBM disease. You may have heard of that as good pastures. With good pastures, you've got antibodies directed at the collagen in your glomerulus. It targets the collagen, sets up an inflammatory reaction, and you get hematuria. Whereas we've just spoken about diabetic nephropathy, you get glucose effectively deposited in the kidneys, giving you this issue. Amyloid was in our question earlier. What is amyloid? It's a little difficult to wrap your head around. Amyloid is a misfolded protein, basically. It's a protein that has folded in the wrong way and therefore it ends up precipitating and can then do a bit of damage. And we typically find that it can either arise because of myelomas or anything that has some sort of inflammatory process going on. You've got an inflammatory process going on, you're generally making a lot of proteins. They can become misfolded. So in our question earlier, we mentioned it was amyloid. In a second, we'll get on to a why was that? And you'll see that the issue is you've got these misfolded proteins that deposit in the kidney, giving you this nephrotic picture. So that's your glomerular nephritis. As I said, each of these, we could spend 10 minutes talking about each one. You probably don't want to. It's getting late on a Friday now. Um, do obviously go away and read up a little bit about them. The whole point of this is to tell you, well, you've got limited time for your exams. What do you want to do? Do you want to spend a whole day learning all of these topics here? Well, you don't need to know a page on each of these. You need to know a few sentences. Whereas being able to differentiate, this is pre-renal, renal, post-renal, post that is so much more important. So make sure you prioritize your revision appropriately. So the one last thing we've got to talk about is vascular causes of a renal cause of renal failure. Bit of a mouthful. So this is not where there's an issue with the renal artery itself, but as we pointed to earlier, there's an issue with the small blood vessels supplying the kidney or supplying the glomerulus. And there are two in particular. Acronyms here don't help. HUS is your hemolytic uremic syndrome. What's that? Typically, it's where someone gets food poisoning with a particular type of E. coli. The E. coli secretes a toxin, toxin 157, and this leads to hemolysis of your red blood cells and thrombocytopenia, because when your blood cells get hemolyzed, that's going to collect with lots of platelets, forms 
these small little clots that get deposited in your small blood vessels and therefore the kidney stops working. And if the kidney stops working, you get uremia. You get a buildup of urea because normally the kidney would get rid of urea. So that's hemolytic uremic syndrome. And those kind of three triangles there, that triad makes a lot of logical sense and that shows you what's going on. TTP, so thrombocytopenic purpura, that is a little bit different. You get the same three things again. The exact causes behind it is a bit more complicated. Um, I believe it's got to do with some genetic issues in certain proteins in your body. Don't worry too much about it. It gets all very complicated. But again, this is another vascular cause of kidney failure. And the idea is you get the same three things again. Because you have these proteins that don't work properly, you get red blood cells hemolyzing, which clumps together with platelets, thrombocytes, and therefore the kidney stops working. But what helps differentiate it from the previous condition is that you also get a fever and you also get neurological symptoms as well. So perhaps it might be headaches, it might be changes in mood, etc. But what is the thing on there that we haven't seen so far? Thrombocytopenia. None of the conditions we've mentioned so far have brought in thrombocytopenia. So I highlight that to you. That would be a very good indicator that you're looking at one of these conditions. Again, go away and read up a bit more about them. But in an exam setting, you come across a question of, okay, this patient, you've identified they've got an AKI, you know it's a renal cause, so which out of all of the other ones we've mentioned, well, if it's thrombocytopenia, it's probably one of these two. And then these symptoms here might help you differentiate which of those we're looking at. But as we said, at the end of the day, it all comes back to acute tubular necrosis because that's the most common one. But as we've also said that eventually, what will this lead to? Kidneys won't work because you've got these thrombotic microangiopathy going on. So bring all that together. How do you approach an AKI? This is some of what we've talked about already. Firstly, rule out pre-renal. So things like hypovolemia, things like distributive shock. So it might be sepsis, it might be third spacing like pancreatitis, and often the giveaway is observations. They are tachycardic, they are hypotensive. They look dehydrated. Rule out post-renal. So we said often that would be an ultrasound, it will show you some hydronephrosis. And if it's neither of those, it's probably gonna be renal cause, in which case in reality, you're ringing up the renal department, but in an exam setting, this is just a quick revision of some of the things we talked about. Acute tubular necrosis, the tubules die, they slough off into the urine and you get these brown cells. If you get white blood cells instead, you're thinking acute interstitial nephritis or xenophilia because it might be an allergic reaction in the interstitium. Nephrotic and nephritic points you towards your glomerular nephritis. And then you've got low platelets, you're thinking, okay, it must be one of those microangiopathic, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. Sorry, again, quite a mouthful. So that's a lot. I know it's a lot. I don't expect you to remember all of that. Even 50% of it would be great. As always, stick to what's common. At the end of the day, in reality, these are probably the four most common issues. So sepsis. Sepsis, your blood pressure goes down because you have a distributive shock and therefore your kidney doesn't get enough of a blood supply and it goes into a pre-renal AKI. Obstruction. So someone has a distended bladder, they have a kidney stone, it's obstructing some part of the kidney's outflow and you get hydronephrosis, you get a post-renal AKI. Or the others, your parenchymal disease, so there's an issue in the kidney itself and that could be an allergen, it could be something infective, it could be a toxin as well. So let's return to our questions then. So with this one, We've got here a lady with pain in her left flank. And she hasn't urinated in the last 12 hours. I can see why you said post renal AKI because you think, okay, she hasn't urinated for a while. She's got some sort of outflow obstruction. But she's also got this urgency, urgency, frequency. She's febrile as well. So, why this is a difficult question, it's kind of a two parter question. You first have to figure out what her diagnosis is. You then have to relate it to the problem at hand. So in the chat, what is her diagnosis? Let's start with that. What is actually wrong with her? What's, what are these symptoms pointing towards? So someone's saying UTI, yeah. And then yes, UTI leading to a pyelonephritis. 
untreated UTI, you've got your bacteria climbing up the outflow of your kidneys until eventually it gets to the kidneys itself. And going back to what we said earlier, you look at her urine, you've got protein, leukocytes and nitrites. So it's suggesting she's got some sort of UTI, she's got some sort of infection in the waterworks. And the ultrasound of her abdomen was normal. So already that rules out the post-renal. The pre-renal, okay, if she went into sepsis, it might cause a pre-renal. But given what we've got here, we're thinking acute interstitial nephritis, because like we said in the previous example, if you've got this ongoing pyelonephritis, you're going to get inflammatory cells spilling into the interstitium, giving you this presentation. So that was one question. And now our last one then, this is probably the hardest question of today. Before I bring up the bits and bold, I bring up the answer. We did say it was amyloidosis. And again, tricky because this is a two part, if not perhaps a three part question. So let's start with her kidney issues. Does she have nephrotic or nephritic syndrome? What do you think? Post in the comments. Yeah, nephrotic. Nephrotic, nephrotic. Yeah, it's nephrotic because she's got lots of protein. Now, which answer options does that eliminate? Which of those would not be nephrotic? Yeah, B, because it says there, glomerular nephritis, we think nephritic. IgA, yeah. One more. Which other one would be inflammatory? Yeah, SLE, lupus. So B, C, and D are all inflammatory issues. So we'd expect them to have a nephritic picture. In reality, yes, it's not perfect. You can have a bit of both. But B, C, and D, we immediately get rid of using that knowledge of, well, this is probably nephrotic, it's not nephritic. So it's either A or it's E. And then in your mind, you're thinking, well, what in the question is pointing towards diabetes? And what in the question is pointing towards amyloidosis? Now, there's nothing in the question to suggest she's diabetic. But she does have some swellings. The edema, okay, that's the nephrotic syndrome. But the swellings in the joints of her fingers, what is that pointing towards? What do we think? Arthritis, what kind of arthritis? Yeah, rheumatoid arthritis. So MCP joints really typically affected in rheumatoid arthritis. This stiffness getting out of bed in the morning, it's typical of an inflammatory arthritis. So what did we say earlier? Inflammatory processes can predispose you to amyloidosis. It means you have a buildup of amyloid because of all this inflammation going on. The amyloid can eventually deposit in the kidneys and therefore your kidneys stop working properly, giving you this nephrotic picture. So hopefully it now makes sense why the answer is amyloidosis. And yes, it's a really horrible question because there's a lot of topics in there that people aren't that comfortable with. But you can see that knowing that it's nephrotic actually does most of the work for you. And then the rest of it, you're thinking, well, there's nothing to point towards diabetes, but there is stuff to point towards rheumatoid. Rheumatoids associated with amyloidosis. OK, we've got amyloidosis. So that's it for today. Takeaway messages. Differentiate lung cancer types using demographics. So age, smoking. Where is it located? Does it metastasize early? Does it metastasize late? What are the perineoplastic syndromes? When you're trying to come across your exam revision and you've got a lot to revise and you've not got all the time in the world, firstly, start with overlapping areas. Number one, because they're probably quite high yield. Number two, because it helps you go back over things and consolidate what you've studied. Acute kidney injury, most of the time is going to be pre-renal. So most of your questions are going to be pre-renal. But if it's not pre-renal, it's not post-renal, okay, now it's renal. In reality, if you've got that far as a doctor, as an F1, you've done most of what you need to do. You ring up renal and they'll either tell you what to do next or they will come down and see the patient. But use those little bits of info that we've got on the slides. Someone's asking where will we find the slides. They'll be sent out to you over the next few days. And that other bit of info, nephrotic syndrome points towards the presence of something. Nephritic suggests inflammation. Yes, that is a rule of thumb. It's not always perfect, but that will help you generally differentiate between the two. 
Quick question there in the comments. Page with myelomas can present with AKI with a few other blood abnormalities. What type of AKI would this be? Or is it not necessarily classified as an AKI? Difficult. So as we said, myelomas can give you amyloidosis. So you would consider it to be more of a renal issue because the kidneys are getting damaged due to the fact that the actual kidney itself has this amyloid deposition and the other things going wrong with myeloma, your light chains, et cetera. Um, what also makes amyloidosis, sorry, makes myeloma a bit more complicated is you're anemic. And we said earlier that the kidneys need blood. If you're anemic, your kidneys aren't getting a blood supply or they're not getting as good of a blood supply, which exacerbates things. So the simple answer to your question, myeloma would be renal, but in reality, it's perhaps not as simple as that. I imagine a renal consultant would have a lot more to say. So I'll be hanging around for the next few minutes if you've got any questions. Hopefully that was useful for you all. I know there was quite a lot to take in. Please, please, please fill in the feedback. There's a QR code on the screen. You've also got the link here. It takes about a minute, but we really appreciate the feedback. This is the end of this week's lecture. Glad to hear that people liked it. I'll likely be doing a lecture in the next week or so. You'll find more info. Um, but as long as you sign up to our mailing list, you'll be getting info on next week's lectures. And probably the week after, I'll be coming back to do one on GI. So hopefully I'll see you then. We've got loads of other lectures all figured out for you. So best luck to everyone with your revision. Again, I'm, I'm hanging around to answer any questions you've got. But otherwise, if you filled in the feedback, feel free to leave. Do I go to King's? So I will be at King's technically. I'll be going to Tommy's, St. Thomas's in August, but I went to Imperial myself. First time real has been explained so well, glad to hear. Again, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Let's see if we've got anything else here. Oh, interesting questions. I understand perineoplastic syndromes you told are only associated with small cell, but are they also associated with any non-lung cancers? I believe yes potentially they are. So say insulinomas, you can get an insulinoma in your GI tract. So it's not just lung cancers, but probably the most common cancer that will give you perineoplastic would be lung cancers. That's why we've related them there today. But yes, you might get some GI issues. Someone else, how do you get involved with research in medical school? I'd say for myself personally, it was my BSc. So my BSc project, for most people, that's probably their largest exposure to research. After that, I got involved in a lot of education research. I really enjoy teaching. Um, and you'll find that it's quite easy to get education research definitely presented at conferences. Getting it published is a bit harder, but if you're involved in any education projects, either any mentoring schemes, any tutorials like we're doing today, you'll find that feedback is really useful because it gives you some data. And whenever you've got data, you've got the potential to do research. So actually, I think education is quite a nice, easy way to get involved with things. Is carcinoid syndrome also associated with liver cancer? Um, personally, I don't know. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, can lung cancer itself, sorry, can liver cancer itself secrete do you get neuroendocrine cells? I'm not too sure. I'll have a look into that. And if you're on the next lecture, maybe I'll mention that. But to be honest, I'm not too sure. Um, what is your advice for a new F1? I don't know. I'm a new F1 too. Um, so if you've got any advice for me, that would be great. Um, so yeah, anything else? I think that's it. Um, da, 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 da. Um, I'm unsure if there was anything on the YouTube. Again, if you want to hang around, there's a few people left. Um, I'll quickly check the YouTube for any questions, and if that's it, we're all done. Let's see what people have said. Um, da, 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 da. How do you get access to previous slides? Um, personally, I'm not too sure of that process but we'll have a way to get it out to you. So just drop us an email if you're unsure, if you haven't got access to the previous slides, but just hang tight over the next few days, most of those will go, be going out. If you don't get them in the next week or so, then drop us an email and we'll make sure that we get those to you. Um, looks like no messages from our YouTube stream. Um, so if no one's got any questions, I think we'll end it there. Thank you very much, everyone. And hope you all have a lovely weekend.
goodbye.